preference that the more people I kill, uh, the happier I am, is at least as crazy as someone who made the reversal on the Kahneman and Traversky thing. And yet in economics, somehow, we say that that's just, you can believe whatever you want in that. You know, we'll just take your preferences as given. But then you keep, you're not allowed to be, you know, if you prefer killing 100,000 people in this situation, then you, you, rationality requires that in this other situation, you also prefer slaughtering you know, people, right? So, so we're not willing to rule, rule out genocide as, as a rational motive, and yet we are willing to rule out, so that, that seems like, you know, that seems completely crazy. Uh, and similarly, you know, not um, wanting to have any love in your life, uh, if you were to write down an economic model of someone who just wants to maximize like their money income and doesn't care at all about love or doesn't care at all about their children, those people, I would say, are far more irrational. And in fact, that's like typical psychopathic behavior. Then it's <laughs> someone who, who just, you know, doesn't have... So it's just a, only an economist could believe that a reasonable definition of rationality ruled in the type of behaviors we're willing to rule in and ruled out the types of behaviors that we, uh, we rule out. Um, and now, I, I strongly believe that some of the things that we assume people care about in economics are things that people care about or should care about, like their long-term material gain. And in fact, most, much of economics gets its real predictive power not out of rationality, but out of the assumption that people care about money. And I think that's a reasonable thing for people to care about. And I think you think anyone is irrational who didn't care about it. But it's not the internal consistency that's doing the work. It's the belief that they care about certain things. Um, so uh, another thing that we often assume in economics <coughs> is that people care about the same types of things in different circumstances. No matter where they are or who they are, they care about love, money, health, etc. And that it's really the conditions they face that differ and not their preferences. Yeah, go ahead. I'm curious how this relates to the past, and is that some philosophers would yeah. identify, of sort of using reason to identify what, which of these preferences are plausible in yeah. the first place? Like how, how do you talk about what they Well, I think a lot of decision theory is very similar to philosophy. It's point, it points out inconsistencies between the two. So, yeah, I mean, I think basically what all philosophy is is applied rationality. It's like, it, it's doing things like what we've been talking about, thinking through what seems reasonable, what seems consistent with one another, what, you know, so, so I think that in, in many ways, decision theory is just as much a branch of philosophy as it is economics. Um, a second thing is that people have reasonable beliefs. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they believe the same thing that you have, they might have different information, or there might be different fundamental dif uh some fundamental differences in beliefs that we think are reasonable. But if someone believes something that you think is just nuts, like they think that you know, the world is going to end in a couple of weeks, I mean, there's fundamentally no reason why they couldn't believe that. But I think you'd be much more ready to hold a conversation with someone who is imperfectly rational in some of these ways than with someone who thought the world was going to end in a week, right? I mean, you'd think that person was just totally irrational. And you would use the term irrational. So like, why, why not use it here? Uh, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, I had a question because I don't really see why the internal consistency is like a uh, hurt. Because I have the impression that in the, also in the example of Kahn and Kresge, yeah. actually uh, it was just that the uh, possibility set was different in both situations. So uh, like uh, in one case I had the possibility also to choose voluntarily of people dying. Yeah. And the other one I had not this choice. I, I totally agree. And but so the but the point about the internal consistency is that literally if you give me any application where internal consistency does any work at all, where it literally says anything, you, it's always possible to claim what you just claimed, that the choice sets were different in the two situations. So literally it means nothing. If, but, also, but you could also mean the other way that rationality is not actually has to be defined in a, in a, in a narrow sense, but in a very broad sense, because it includes like also social, I mean rationality, like uh, it's just that the, actually it's not that a critique of the rationality, but a critique of the well, but if that's the, if that's the truth, if rationality is defined in that way, then it literally is completely useless. It literally says nothing. Yeah. I mean, <coughs> because I could uh, I could say okay, I give a, um, a certain utility to, for example, having uh, five contacts per day, or I have a utility of having three contacts per day, or I could phrase it in terms of quality of 
But, but, but let's, so let's take the example that you gave to Aaron. Right? Yeah, that Aaron was giving. He said that rationality implies people respond to incentives. Well, it does not imply that unless you mean incentives in the, the, the tautological sense, unless you make some specific assumption, which is that you know people prefer more money to less money, or people prefer. So in other words, rationality never gives you any implications except when combined with with concrete commitments about what people value and do not value, or about what are relevant or not relevant distinctions between situations. So all the time, we are making assumptions about people's preferences. We're never just making assumptions about internal consistency, which is the way that economists always, in their rhetoric, describe what they're doing. So I mean, I'm just, it's not, what I'm saying is not at all surprising, or not, not at all, not, you know, just common sense, but, it's completely inconsistent with the way that we often talk about things, especially in the revealed preference and decision theory uh, framework. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, how do you go about defining what a reasonable beliefs? Like, I mean, some people might, you know, like, yeah. kind of, what's the. I, I don't know how you go about defining what a reasonable beliefs. What's the whole point? So we can all define reasonable beliefs differently and then how do you yeah. have a content? So. Well, so, I mean, I might call something irrational, you might not call it irrational, but that doesn't mean that. You know, I believe that you're wrong, you believe that I'm wrong, and I, if I believe you're wrong enough, I might think that you're irrational too. I mean, in fact, the people who think the world's going to end in a week might also think that we're irrational for not believing that the world's going to end in a week. I mean, so this idea that everything's just going to come from outside, and that you don't actually have to do any work yourself judging what you think is reasonable and it's not, that's just silly, right? The idea that you know everything should be reducible to an axiom, in fact, what I'm going to try to show you in a minute is that all of science is of that form. That any, literally any scientific claim that someone makes, there's no way to give it a justification. It has to come from, in the end, you taking something on faith. So uh, there's consistency across time. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm not sure I completely understand what you mean with your because if you, like if rationality is important to the last Yeah, so I mean, we, it's not that we couldn't necessarily predict his behavior, but we usually, in our models, make an assumption that people believe the world is going to last for a long time. That's how we get a lot of the predictive power out of our models. Otherwise, we would constantly be open to the possibility in our models that people are going to behave as if they believe the world is going to end in them. So in other words, most of what our models impose to make predictions when we say rationality is carries a ton more along with it. In fact, I think here's a great example of why it carries a ton more along with it than just the internal consistency of beliefs. So, I mean, consistency across time is another, but another one, in fact, Einstein's definition of rationality or sanity was that an insane person does the same thing over and over again and expects different results, right? So we would almost certainly think someone was nuts if they kept going out into the street getting hit by a car and then saying, well, but, you know, that was a really, really low probability event. Uh, it's just, you know, I just got really unlucky, but I'm just going to go back to the street and get hit by a car again. And in fact, in Bayesian decision theory, which we're about to study, there's absolutely nothing irrational about that. You can, I mean, that's a completely consistent Bayesian belief. It's just a completely irrational belief. And in fact, all of our models end up making assumptions that people are, uh, you know, inductive in various ways. But there's just nothing about the internal consistency of beliefs that dictates that. that this was a famous point that Hume made, which is that, you know, anything in science, anything we predict about the future, if someone doesn't believe that, there's just nothing you can say to that person if they just say, look, I don't believe the past predicts the future. The only argument you can give them is to say, well, the past has predicted the future in the past. So, then, of course, that, that is, you know, you know, it's just, this is just faith. You know, the only thing that economists have better than people who believe the world's going to end in 10 days is that we have faith in something uh, which is incredibly hard to use. And they have faith in something that's incredibly easy to use. So basically, we're stuck with this, like, thing we have to run all these experiments to figure stuff out. Whereas they already know the answer, right? But, but still, it all comes down to faith.
Now, um, even in behavioral economics, I want to claim, all of the work is done by things like rationality. Right? So in behavioral economics, people say, oh, they have this one preference thing that doesn't correspond with what we would usually call rationality. But then they pursue that incredibly consistently, as you were just, uh, I don't know your name, but oh, Jim. Jim. What Jim was saying was exactly that people do something irrational, but then they're very rational except for that one irrational thing they do. And all the work in the model is actually done not by the assumption of irrationality, but by the assumption of rationality coupled with one little part of irrationality. So, um, rationality as a way of interpreting or talking about behavior is not the only paradigm in economics, but it's definitely the primary one. So now I want to talk about what we would consider to be rational attitudes for someone to have towards uncertainty. Um, and uh, Carl, Carl, what what do you think? What what, what do economists usually say about what are reasonable attitudes to have to uncertainty, uh, or what do philosophers say for that matter? Well, the there's different states in the world, and you assign probabilities to the different states. Like yeah. Some to one. And that you, usually, yeah, you obey a probability calculus, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to assign probabilities between 0 and 1 to anything that could occur. The probability of something happening has to be 1. And if there's a bunch of things which you know can't happen at the same time, then the probability of all of some, one of them happening has to be the sum of the probability of each of them happening. Right? Those are the three laws of probability calculus. And these imply that you obey Bayes' rule, uh, which you learned in your stats class or your kind of metrics class. So one would do that. So, if you believe these things, and I think that these are good things, I'm basically asking you to be a Bayesian. But being a Bayesian is, and in, in Bayesianism, probabilities represent how plausible an event is. How reasonable you think that it's likely to occur. And they're subjective in the sense that they represent your individual beliefs. They're, they don't come from anywhere else. Um, but being a Bayesian is really, really hard. And let me try to point that out. So, um, uh, Carl, what do you think, or who, who here is the most religious Bayesian? Who truly believes that they're a Bayesian in this audience? Nobody wants to volunteer. <laughs> 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 yes. no. Okay, so I'm going to kill you. I'm going to pretend like you're a big Bayesian. Okay. So what do you think, what do you think that USG, what do you think the distribution of US GDP in 2020 is? Does anyone else want to say what the distribution of the distribution of US GDP in 2020? It's like that. In levels or in levels? In levels. 2020 US GDP in nominal that year uh, dollars. You want to try? Okay. Well, the point is, if, you, if anyone tried to give an answer here, the fact that you guys are already not giving the answer is already showing that you realize how hard it is to be a Bayesian, right? So, but any, any answer you gave here, if I then were to ask you, what do you think the distribution of growth of GDP for every year between now and then is, I can almost guarantee that if you give it to me in two or three minutes, that these two things would be inconsistent with one another, right? Um, and so the point is, you're never going to actually be able to express a belief which is consistent with Bayes' rule. It's just, it's just not possible, right? Um, but nonetheless, I think there is a compelling argument that if you hold any two beliefs and someone shows you that they're inconsistent with the probability calculus, that you should probably try to adjust one belief or try to adjust the other one. And why is that? Well, otherwise people can arbitrage you. So, um, Consider the winner of the Nobel Prize next year. Imagine that two among many of the possibilities are that Lars Hansen wins on his own or that John Terrell wins on his own. Uh, and someone asked you to set fair odds for these, which is some price uh, in terms of the amount that you have to pay for winning a dollar if the Terrell or Hansen event occurs. And they also ask you to set a fair odd for whether the event that either Terrell wins alone or Hansen wins alone. 